Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Hello and welcome back to the Australian Finance Podcast. I'm your host, Kate Campbell, and I'm joined today by my co-host and Chief Investment Officer at Rask Invest, Owen Rask. Kate, always a pleasure. There's a lot of Rasks in there. There was. Um, welcome to this episode. It's always fun when we get to talk about AI. Cue the scary music. Yes, it is a topic that came yeah. up in basically every of our stops on the Rask Roadshow. Everyone wanted to know about artificial intelligence, how that's impacting their careers, their investment portfolios, the future more broadly, and what that means for them. Yeah. So we'll cover all that as well as some companies and ETFs that allow you to invest in a way that kind of captures some of the AI buzz, uh, but it's definitely a bit of a buzzword at the moment. Um, there have been many over centuries, but this is the latest one. So yes. We we'll talk all about it. We talk about thematic investing a little bit and our core and our satellite. And this is a theme right now that many of our listeners are interested in thinking about how they can add that to their satellite. Mm, absolutely. So um, we'll discover all that and more in a minute. But Kate, tell us, please, what is AI? So I went to the source. I have okay. two sources today, but IBM, which is a, a pretty reliable source, mm -hmm. they described AI is a field which combines computer science and robust data sets to enable problem solving. It, auto, it also encompasses subfields of machine learning and deep learning, which are frequently mentioned in conjunction with artificial intelligence. Wow. This is uh, scary stuff. IBM sounds like something out of Terminator, uh, for those of you that are old enough to watch an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, um, where he has to go and destroy the the chip before it takes over the world. Okay, what about ChatGPT, one of the most popular tools, or if prob it probably is the most popular for people to experience this? So I only actually just got a ChatGPT account this morning. I wow. have avoided it the whole year. Okay. Not intentionally, I just didn't think about it. But anyway, I thought I should ask it to describe itself. Mm -hmm. So ChatGPT says that artificial intelligence, often abbreviated as AI, is a rapidly evolving field of computer science that mm -hmm. focuses on creating smart machines that can perform tasks typically requiring human intelligence. In essence, AI aims to make machines think and learn like humans, allowing them to understand, reason, and solve problems. Wow. So I thought its, its response was bit more understandable than the first one. Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah, and you'd expect that first ChatGPT versus IBM. Uh, one of them is definitely more innovative than the other. Uh, and so basically, it's about using data to try and form a perspective or some sort of intelligence from that data. Yeah. And I, I went on to have a very extensive conversation with ChatGPT this morning, and I wanted to see what it could do. And in the limits, I was asking it to give me savings tips, give me fun savings tips, tell mm -hmm. me how to invest, how to open a brokerage account, how to build a portfolio, what are the risks of mm -hmm. investing in different types of portfolios. And it was generally pretty good if I mentioned quite specific terminology and instructions. If I mentioned it needed to be Australian, otherwise it was giving me default US mm -hmm. ideas and terminology. So I think it's kind of a good tool to use at the moment if you're looking for ideas or Wanting explainers, though, be careful because it did make up an ETF. Yeah, yeah, it, that didn't uh, actually exist. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's yeah, it's really interesting, and I think for investors, the question is: Are we in like a hype cycle in a bubble? Yeah, absolutely. Like all of these things are, in my opinion, are blown out of proportion. Uh, both the doomsayers and the kind of zealots that are like thinking that. This is going to be a complete revolution for the entire world. Um, you might know that uh, last week at the time of recording, I was in Sydney for South by Southwest and my job was to moderate a panel of intellectual property lawyers who specialize in trademarks, professors, these types of people, wonderful people up on the stage. 
And basically we're talking about, well, imagine that you create uh, a logo. You're in the metaverse with Mark Zuckerberg and um, you're in Zuckville. And in there, you're creating a logo for your little fictitious business in this fake world. Who owns the logo? Is it Mark Zuckerberg's meta or Facebook or is it you? And then same with AI. You can use a tool for those of you that don't know about it. Now, there's a tool called Midjourney. I don't know if you've used that, Kate, if you've just new to the I, chat I'm GPT all bandwagon. new this morning. Okay. Well, Midjourney is basically taking what you have experienced so far with chat GPT where you have text responses and you use your text responses to input uh, at something that you want and it will create the image version. Wow. So, uh, it can do that. Like yesterday, I wanted Warren Buffett in boxing gloves and it gave me Warren Buffett in boxing gloves. Um, and Makes you can sense. do the same thing with many of the other ones like auto GPT uh, and all these other things where it actually does the tasks for you. So you don't even have to prompt it. Um, but uh, I think Arjun from GlobalX at our Adelaide event gave a, gave a great example of how this works. So if you think about a dog, a dog through evolution uh, is able to walk. We don't have to train a dog to walk it. Once it's a puppy, it grows up, it can walk, right? We don't have to train it. So there's something kind of innate in it. It can walk, but then imagine that the puppy hits some ice and the ice is on a slope. If it walked the same way straight across that ice, it would slip and fall. And the reason is it hasn't been trained on ice. It's been trained to walk on normal land. And so this is exactly the same thing with ChatGPT. It's trained on data. And when it gets to a certain point, it will fall and it will tumble down the hill. It's exactly the same idea with ChatGPT. And at the end of the day, it comes back to the data that it is trained on. Um, and that's why a lot of the mid-journey images that are created look pretty similar. People can identify pretty quickly if it's a, a mid-journey image. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not powerful, but it just means that it's using data that everyone has access to. And we should say it's not just about ChatGPT. Everyone thinks OpenAI started this. It definitely did not in any sense of the word. Uh, it's just the one that people know really well. Um, Google Bard has been in existence for a long time. It's been being worked on for a long time. And there are numerous other instances. Like, mm. And it's getting applied to a lot more use cases than just us having a conversation with the computer. It's been mm. applied in healthcare and defense and all yeah. sorts of settings. And this is the thing I don't think a lot of investors truly understand yet because they maybe didn't come from a technologist background. But uh, one of the things that we will most likely see is, in my opinion, is say, for example, Microsoft. Microsoft has a, an equity arrangement with OpenAI and it made an investment early on and it made an investment recently. And then eventually my understanding is that equity will slowly be released. So Microsoft won't have that ownership over OpenAI, which is the whole idea behind the business. Um, but the, the, the reality is what we'll see, for example, with Microsoft is we won't necessarily see Microsoft have a, a line in its annual report that says, AI income or AI revenue, AI sales. It won't say that. What you'll just see is you'll see Microsoft Office. You'll see the sales from Microsoft Office go up because there's a new thing called Copilot where you can pay more for Microsoft Office and you get GPT built into it. And basically what happens is you say inside Microsoft PowerPoint, you say, I want a seven page um, PowerPoint presentation covering investing 101 and it will create seven slides covering the major topics in Microsoft and it does it in 15 seconds as opposed to you spending three hours on it and you'll pay more for that for that productivity. So is it going to take our jobs? Well, Steve Sammartino had a really good idea uh, on the show. He broke it into two camps. He said the Luddites and the, what is the other ones, the Neos or something like this and he basically said that there'll be people who choose to use it and people who resist it just like in all of human history. Um, and people that go along with it will probably um, get further ahead than those that don't. And, you know, even remember when automated cash registers at Woolworths or Uniqlo or wherever you shop, remember they came out with their cash registers and everyone's like, well, I'm going to be out of a job. It basically just changed the job. It didn't remove it. It just changed it. And I think that's the, that's the thing in my opinion. I'm only one person, right? It's only just my perspective. But if we look at all of the great in technologies over time, it actually has just enhanced people's productivity. It hasn't completely removed them until a long time in the future. Like you could say someone that you know used to print newspapers using the stamps. Um, they used to create stamps that would print on the newspapers. Um, this is you know, centuries, maybe a century ago. Um, that has changed. The printing press is no longer in existence and people who worked and specialized on that no longer have a job. 
But at the same time, their roles would have evolved through time. Yeah, I think that's the thing, being adaptive to new technologies and learning how you can use them to enhance your role. Yeah. Yeah. If you, I think what we were were talking about this uh, in Bali the other day, a friend of mine is an engineer, and we're saying how a lot of the roles that we have today, people have an opportunity to massively cash in on people's ignorance. And what I mean by that is if you know a little bit about ChatGPT or any of these tools that have become popular, but someone else doesn't, and they want you to do a job for them, you could say, yeah, I'll charge you the same rate as always. But now it's going to take you 10% of the time, but you're charging the same rate. They don't know that you're using GPT, but you know, you've all of a sudden massively costed out your business. Say a good example is video editing. Uh, like Monique, our wonderful videographer, if she wanted to, she could use AI tools inside Adobe uh, and those tools can help her edit maybe three times faster than normal. And so... Now, all of a sudden, she has her business that she can run, but at the same time, she has fewer costs on the other side in time. So that's a massive improvement. And so there's an opportunity there for people to take advantage of that and to make more money from it, not less. Same with software engineering, same with accounting. Um, Yeah. So I I guess as investors, if we're thinking about how that's going to play a role in our portfolios, is it going to change the makeup of our portfolios? Do you think it's going to change our core portfolios? I know you were playing around with like, build me a portfolio, please, chat GPT earlier. I was pretty impressed. Yeah, that sometimes it's pretty good. Um, it's not customized to you, but you can hmm. provide inputs of what you want and things like that. I, I did appreciate that it was giving a disclaimer that you should uh, do your own of research and <laughs> uh, talk to a financial <laughs> advisor, like uh, even chat GPT knows. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the thing is, so I've, when it first came out, GPT, I was using it for these types of things. And you might remember, you might laugh at this, but, you know, for about four or five years now, I've been creating automated articles, right? And these are exactly the same thing as what we're seeing, except um, I don't have an endless source of data like, say, BARD or GPT does. But basically, the concept is you train something on data, it gets smarter through time. Uh, And in my case, I used it to write articles and it still writes articles. It still writes 20 articles a day for us. And we use that and people read the articles and they don't even know. I know. You know, you know. Um, But most people don't, Mm -hmm. right? And the idea is that people can use these tools, but it's only if you get down into the weeds, you realize that sometimes they are not what they seem. I'll give you an example. So I put ChatGPT and Google Bard side by side. And I asked it to create what we call a correlation matrix. It might sound very fancy, but basically it's like all of the big ETFs, you put them side by side and you see how they relate to each other, like how they move in conjunction, right? Correlations, like the relationship between two things. And it got basically every single one of them wrong. And then I pointed out, I said, dear chat GPT, I think you're wrong on this one. And then it goes, okay, here's the new table created for you. Wrong. And I go, okay, well... I still think it's wrong. It shouldn't be this number. And they're like, here's a new one. Wrong. And every time I did it, it was just more and more wrong. And um, I think there is a limit to it. Like if we go back to the dog walking across ice, there are some things it just isn't good enough at. And I was chatting to uh, Richard White, who is the the founder of um, WiseTech, a $20 billion company. One of Australia's wealthiest people. I think he's the wealthiest person on the entire entire Australian Stock Exchange yesterday. The company is a wonderful technology company from right around the world. And um, he said to me, it's big A, little I. A lot of artificial, not much intelligence. And I'd probably agree with him on that. And he said, people are talking about it like a revolution in technology. He goes, I would disagree. I think it's an evolution. Mm. And I agree with that as well in that it's artificial, sure. It's not that intelligent when you dig below the surface. And it's really just a step change. It's not really a game changer yet, I would say. But it could be? It could be, yeah, of course. It could be. Like, it's going to change the way people operate. But in terms of it being able to solve everything, I think we're still a long way away from that. Hmm. And it, the best example is for anyone that has a Tesla or has ever been in one and they've talked about like Elon Musk always bangs on about self-driving and you've experienced full self-driving this is where it drives for you. it's called autopilot it is not perfect like it, 
take it from me, it is not perfect. Like it comes to a car on the road that you can normally just drive around, it will just shut down and it'll be like, too risky. I'm just going to back out of this one. I'm stopping here. And then you just got to take over as the driver. And that's basically where we are with all of these tools. It's like, it's great because it can drive you along the highway, but as soon as it gets to something it's never seen before, it's just going to stop. Yeah. And you still got to verify the information because mm. it, if it's making up facts and making up ETFs, like that's not a perfect solution for you. And that's why I think the best way investors can approach this is actually just to invest in the companies that are benefiting from it. So Which not to, are probably already in your ETFs. Yeah, yeah. So like NVIDIA is one of the biggest companies in the world now. That makes the GPUs for basically everyone. Yeah, Microsoft, you mentioned, is in yeah. your yeah. US ETF. Yep, yeah, it's in the NASDAQ ETF. Uh, it's in the um, S&P 500, the IVV, if you own that. It's in VGS, if you own that. Um, Wise Tech is the Australian business that I was mentioning before with Richard White. That's in everything. And this isn't a direct play on AI, but they will benefit from it because he was telling me yesterday, they've got 3,000 staff. They immediately paid for all of them to have Copilot in Microsoft Office. Yeah. So they all had GPT available in their Google Docs, in their presentations, in their emails so that they wouldn't make mistakes. How amazing is that? Uh, Google owns Google Bard or Alphabet owns Google Bard. That's their version, which is, to be honest, I think it's when it first came out, when Google Bard first came out, this is pretty crap. I'm like, to be honest, this is really not that good. But even in the last six months, if anyone has been playing around with Google Bard, I think it's got so much better and it's free. Anyone can use it for free. Um, like You know how we use Google Workspace for work? Yeah. I don't know if you guys have noticed this already, but it's now starting to summarize. Oh, in our chats. Yeah. So if you have like five messages in your group chat, it will now say, Kevin said this and Kate said that, and this is the question you've got to answer. Yeah, it, it, it also pulls out action points. So yeah. when you write an essay, it pulls out the key things you actually wanted. Exactly. <laughs> which and, is quite helpful. And it's becoming available in Google Docs. So again, you can, oh, okay. so you don't even have to worry about like Grammarly or those things that we rely on. Yeah. It automatically. So instead of having to go to a separate program to ask it questions, it, the tools are going to be embedded in things you're already Everything using. Everything you do day to day. So there'll be fewer mistakes in your work. Um, and this is where like engineers, like software engineers, it's just been a game changer because normally if you write code, it's so technical. If you put a, a dot or you put like a, a curly bracket instead of a square bracket or whatever you've put in there, it will just be like broken and you don't know why. This thing will automatically reads it as you go through and it says, no, this should be this. Press tab to correct this line of code and you just keep going down and down and down. Other businesses, like I mentioned, Tesla is the leader in self-driving tech. Uh, meta platform. So uh, I'll just quickly pull this up. But yeah, because I know you put a list together of uh, shares and ETFs that were playing on the AI theme. Yeah. So anyone, we'll put a link in the show notes. You can um, get a get access to this report that uh, we put out as an article. Um, but I'm going to put you on the spot here. So Facebook slash Meta, right? Last few years, it's been in the doldrums a bit. Since everyone was like hashtag delete Facebook, people still don't know. But Facebook also owns Instagram and WhatsApp. So it's not just one thing. It's a family of apps. I want you to tell me year to date, just take a guess off the top of your head, massive company, how much has it gone up or down since the beginning of the year? Well, I know the NASDAQ has gone up quite a bit. Yeah. So let's say 40 or 50%. It's up 152% at the time of recording. Whoa. I would not have guessed that. And the reason, one of the biggest reasons, there's many reasons, but the big, big reason it's gone up so fast is all of the social media platforms are now using the AI tools to bet to deliver you more viral videos, more viral content, more predictive content. They've always had it, like Facebook's always had it, but now they've just got like free reign to use it. And that's why your reels and Instagram are better than ever, right? That's why if you're on TikTok, you're you're using more of it than ever before because they've been like, well, we'll just plug into this engine now and serve them content that actually is relevant to them. You don't know it's happening, it's but it's slightly happening. terrifying. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is, right? Our brains are getting trained on 30 second pieces of content. Yeah. That's a that's a <laughs> that's a part two of the podcast. But, but th- that's why Facebook has been a huge winner over the last few years. Even even though people were like like when because you were saying that you asked it like for stock, not for stock, but for e- uh, brokerage platforms to, that you could use to yeah, buy ETFs, Yeah, well, I right? asked it to firstly design an ETF portfolio for me that's diversified, would provide me some income, mm-hmm. that's a growth-focused portfolio. And then I asked how to actually execute that. So how would I invest in those ETFs? And it just sort of stepped you through everything. Yeah. 
very pro, and it gave some examples of Australian brokerage accounts. So people, a lot of people, when they heard people like you doing that, their first in- the reaction was, hold on a second, I don't need Google search anymore because I'll just download this app on my phone. I don't need to search for the answer anymore. Like there's that mental energy of typing it into yeah. Google, finding the right search result, clicking on that blog, reading that article. I don't need to do that anymore. I'll tell you what, I'll just put it into ChatGPT and get the answer. And so people were like, well, Alphabet or Google, search results are its number one way of make money. That's now defunct. And that's totally not the case. We can see now that Google said, well, you think this is our risk? It's actually our greatest opportunity. So we're going to use this for better search results, for more tools in our apps, for like all of these things. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, okay, yeah. Alphabet, it's okay. Yeah, because they <laughs> like they could use this software to say these are the three most relevant articles to your question. Yeah, and they've been doing this to surface content for many years now. Like if you go to the rich text snippets, I don't know if anyone's geeky enough to know what that means. But basically what it means is when you put in a query in Google, it automatically um, puts that on the end of your query. Like if you go to a, if you see a website, like say, say you want like, what is my tax rate in Australia if I earn $80,000? You put that into Google, it will come up with the ATO website at the top and a little snippet below that that has the text field. So it automatically knows to search the ATO website because that is the credible source and then puts that highlights that text for you because it knows that that's where people stop on that page. Mm. So it's surfacing the best information. It's been doing that for a while. Um, and I'd highly encourage anyone to go back to 2017 where Sundar Pichai, who is the CEO of Alphabet, or Google, sorry, CEO of Google, he made a presentation of the Google Assistant booking a, uh, a hair appointment for a client. So you could say to your voice assistant, hey, Let's say in this instance, let's call it Kate. Hey, Kate, can you book me a hair appointment at my local barbershop? It would go away and book that for you, make the phone call and everything. Really? And that's been around since 2017. I haven't missed it. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm out of touch with all of this stuff. <laughs> Kids these days. No, yeah. oh, I know. Yeah. But they, these are all been around for a long time. All of these companies that are on this list. So another one would be Altium. This is how things can be good or bad. So Altium makes the software that engineers and designers can use to design things that go inside computers. So they're called uh, printed circuit boards. There's little green and blue things. When you smash open a telephone, you see like a little circuit board. Um, You use Altium software to do that. And its number one competitor is a company called Cadence Systems. It's an American company. Cadence has just added AI to its design. And you can go from doing a design in three days down to 70 minutes. Right, But Altium doesn't have that functionality yet, even though it's the best software. So the competitor has enabled AI. Altium is still ramping up to it. So that's an example, if we go back to Steve Sammartino's example of humans that are enabled and humans that aren't, there are companies that are enabled and companies that aren't. Um, And so you've got to find the investments, if you're trying to find these types of companies that will benefit from AI, not be losing. Now, Altium will adjust and it will, in my opinion, win. But it, in the meantime, you've still got to play the field and know what's going on. Finally, three ETFs that you can put on your watch list. The BetaShares Global Robotics and Artificial Intelligence ETF, RBTZ, has about 40 stocks in it from Global Tech. The Global X FANG ETF, or FANG Plus, which is 10 of the NASDAQ 100 ETF, basically. Uh, and it's got like Facebook, Tesla, Google, that sort of stuff. And even if you just own NDQ or the IVV ETF, the S&P 500 for my shares, you're going to get exposure. So... There are three ways to play AI as investors right now. Number one is just own investments. I think the big losers from AI will be people that don't see AI coming for their industry and don't have any investments. If you don't have any investments, like let's say you're too scared to invest uh, or maybe you just buy a property. Like property is not going to benefit from AI, I can tell you that. Like your home is not going to benefit from it in any meaningful way. But if you have a share portfolio or diversified ETF, you are going to benefit because you're going to have some Google, you're going to have some Facebook, you're going to have some yep. Meta. Have something, right? That's fine. If, you, if that's all you want to do and you want to have your core portfolio, you are going to benefit from AI. Close the lid, walk away, do something else, come back to it in a few years, it'll be fine. You can use ETFs to get the whole industry. So um, like I mentioned, RBTZ or NASDAQ 100 or FANG. They're going to give you a basket approach to finding these tech companies and these AI style companies. And finally, you could buy individual stocks. If you're going to buy individual stocks, this is how I'd do it. I would have a a list of names of companies that I think could be winners. 
and I'd have all of them equally weighted. So if I had five companies that I think could win, like the genuine companies, not just speculative guesses, five of them, if I had 10 grand, two grand in each, and then I would watch them play out over a few years. At year one, I would review and go, okay, it looks like this company and this company are starting to win. And then if I see that happening, then I would take all the chips that I've got on the table in the companies that aren't winning and consolidate them into the companies that are winning. Because a lot of people at the beginning of a hype cycle, they try to pick the one winner. That is incredibly difficult. Like trying to pick Amazon when a hundred companies went bust for every one Amazon there was. Or trying to pick Google when there was Alta Vista and Yahoo and all these other things. Don't do that. It's too hard in my opinion. Just take a basket approach first with ETFs, then as a next step, try and identify a few winners and have small investments in each of them and then consolidate as you learn more. But do, I think the biggest risk is people that just go and put all their money in one idea. It's very speculative and it won't work. That's it. And probably the other way to play it is actually just thinking about your career and how, if point. you are investing in yourself and your development, because I think you were mentioning off air to me, if your career is basically a box ticking exercise, that could be a place where AI is used to fill that role. So how do you yeah. stand out from a crowd? How do you build your personal brand? How do you have a mix of different skill sets that make you more valuable to an employer? Absolutely, Kate. Like we talked about the law profession, how ChatGPT or any of the bots can basically read the whole corporations act and interpret it in a second. For us to read it would take maybe two weeks, depending on who you are. It's pretty big. Yeah, but it could do it in seconds, right? And so your advantage is not going to be able to recite facts. This is the key thing. The advantage is going to be in insights and yeah. creativity. And we've seen this, this is coming from a guy that works in the finance industry, which is also susceptible to this trend. But people as a rule, people who deal in insight are people who get ahead. People who deal in facts will not get ahead. And I mean that with all sincerity. Like if you think about it, if you can take the facts and you can interpret it and you can problem solve, you are going to get ahead, no matter what your profession. In the case of a, a person in law, if your ability to argue and use the human side is better than the next person, you're going to get ahead. But if your ability is strictly to whatever's said in the text, something else is going to take that place. It's like in investing. If your strategy is to find the companies with the highest dividend yield, GPT will do that in 0.5 seconds. It will take you, even with the tools, it would take you a few hours. right? And so find that thing in your industry that is a human element where you can deal in insights and I think you'll be okay. And you know, I take a good one, it's like this podcast, you could now give GPT this audio and it would probably pay back our voices, which is kind of scary, right? And it could probably get pretty close, but the ability to deal with a human and focus on helping someone is a very different skill set than just replaying things that have been said before. Yeah. Like you can ask for a list of savings tips, but it doesn't have all the nuance and the personal experiences and the, this worked for me, it didn't work for my friend. It doesn't have all of that richness to it yet. Yeah, not yet. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just don't think it's going to be as scary as people suggest. Yeah. I think you can use it as an, to your advantage. And if you haven't already picked it up, like Kate discovered it this morning, go and do it because you're probably doing something at work, which will save you both time and money. Like we use it to edit articles. We put our article in and in Canva that if you've got the new Canva pro or premium or whatever it's called, you can actually get it to design PowerPoints for you. So you could be like, can I have a five five PowerPoint slides on how to buy an ETF. And then you just go through and you you add it yourself. Yeah. I did find one interesting application. I had an app. This was before this morning. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I was using AI already, but you could put your record your brain dumps. So when you're just out and about and you just have a thought about something and it's very unstructured, I could just record a three or five minute clip cool. and it would pull out the the key insights. It would take that brain dump where you hadn't really organized your thoughts and pull out the action points or the, the key points of what you were thinking about. So I found that was quite a helpful tool That's as well. That's really cool. For any investors, I'll give you another example of that. Um, what we've been doing is we get the transcripts from the CEO speeches or from the quarterly results. We get the the transcript, which is just the, like the, the words from the recording, someone transcribes it. Then we take that and you put it into GPT and you say, can you give me the five points that matter? 
You might, they might miss some, to be honest, it probably would, but at least you know what was basically said. Or you might say, what, what were the analyst questions about? And instead of sitting there reading it for half an hour, you can get a real quick take. It's not perfect, but you can get a real quick take on something. And that's really, really powerful. Yeah. So. And I think even just say, as someone trying to manage their finances better, you can use it to get savings tips. You can use it to find if you're looking for a budgeting app, you just need to be specific and say you want something that's Australian, you want something that does this, but it can help you with the research as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I even saw someone in Glenn's My Millennial Money Facebook group said they were using um, AI tools, I think chat GPT, to design their meal plan for the week and then pull cool. out all the ingredients and give them a shopping list. So they were saying what they wanted and what kind of ingredients, how many people they were feeding, um, if they liked particular vegetables or not. So it would design the meal plan for the week, come out with the shopping list, and they could just input it into the Woolies online and have it delivered to their home. That's cool. Coles and Woolies have a, a, a tool where you can add your shopping list now, by the way, which is pretty handy. Mm. I noticed it the other day. But um, yeah, those things are great. I think that's a, that's a really good example of whoever did that. But what I want everyone to remember is this, and this is something that I've, the mantra I've been living with since about 2012, 2013, when I discovered these types of things is everything that can be automated will be automated. The key thing is everything that can be automated. Some things can't. So find what those things are and focus on those. And one of those is like human creativity, um, you know, human centered type of um, yeah. roles, are really important roles. And uh, if you think about it, like in, in 100 years from today, if people are still sitting down and writing computer code the same way they do right now, that's probably going to be a waste of the talent of all those people who could be doing other things instead of writing the code. They could tell the machine to write the code and say what I want. Or if you think about like all of those simple little problems that could be solved in the future by something else, that's not a bad thing. That's a really beneficial thing. Right, And it's not just for Australians, but for the whole human race to be optimized in that way. Um, it's actually a positive thing. It means you can spend more time doing the things with the people you love, not staring at a computer screen. I would love to stare at a computer screen a lot less than I currently do. Yeah. And you, you, you probably will still stare at it, but you might be more productive and you might get more out of your day and, and these types of things. And that's a, that should be something that we all kind of cherish, I reckon. Yeah. So that's what I think about anyway. But you can invest in it. Just be aware that if you're going to buy individual stocks, you're probably going to get hurt along the way unless you are very well diversified and you understand all of the companies that we mentioned today, by the way, should be very much in the satellite of a portfolio. This is not something that I'm putting all of my money in or anything like that. And remember, we always say core in a satellite approach to this. It's a very yeah. exciting technology. Very exciting indeed. And everyone benefits if they are invested in companies, if they're invested in their super fund. Like Any type of investment in a company will have exposure to this. Absolutely. Every business is going to benefit from it, basically, if they've got an internet connection, um, which means if you're invested in those, you will benefit. It's kind of like the old gold rush people back in the day. Um, everyone was so enamored with this idea of finding gold in the hills, but the people who made the money were actually the people that sold the picks and shovels. And that's the old Peter Lynch quote is, the people who sold the Levi jeans, the people who sold the shovels and the, the pans, those are the people that made the money, not the people going out there seeking to find the rare gem. It was people who made it possible. And so these companies that we have on this list, and all companies are going to benefit because they're the ones supplying the picks and shovels. They're just doing it more in an optimized way than ever before. So that's a good thing for everyone. Okay, great. This is heaps of fun. Yep. We'll have the list of all of the different companies and ETFs we mentioned in today's episode in the show notes. So you can check yep. out that full write-up. Yeah, and we'll put a link to the IBM and uh, ChatGPT and Google Bard tools that we mentioned, everything that was mentioned in this episode. So, And if you fun. haven't started investing yet, we have free courses. So that might have a slightly more personal touch than just searching what is an ETF in ChatGPT, though you can do that as well. I, I, I tested that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Stay safe out there. Know the limits of the tools that you're using. Uh, Kate, this was heaps of fun. So thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone.